three questions. I think the frame of all the talk discussions are three questions. What is hope? Uh, where does it come from? And if we as providers or as people can give it to someone or how it works, how works that alchemy? <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever to that is uh, very so, appreciated. So let me give you two answers. One, the first one is from a friend of mine, um, and the second one will be from me. The friend of mine, his name is Bruce Anderson. He lives in Seattle, or he actually lives on an island off of Seattle. He's a consultant for many disabled people and community organizing, and he says. Hope is three things. You need three things to have hope. It has three mm -hmm. components. One is you have to be able to make a picture of what it is in the future that could be better. And the picture has to be detailed enough and realistic enough that you can see it. You have to be able to see that it's, it's possible there what the, the thing is. It's not that you're necessarily going to achieve what your dream or your hope is. But you have to have something that you can actually see as possible. If you go, well, yeah, something might turn out or it could be, but not, not good enough. It's got to be concrete. The second part of hope is you have to turn it inwards. Why is this vision important to me? What would it be different for me? Why would I care about this thing? So if it's going back to school, say, why would that be important to me to go back to school? Is it just busy? Or is it, or why does it really touch me? Because for if you don't have that peace, then when something bad happens, some challenge, some barrier, and there will always be some challenge or some barrier, you'll give up and stop. It won't be worth it. Otherwise, you won't have the motivation that will keep pushing you through. And for that, it's not a motivation because my mother wants me to do this or because it would be a good thing or look good on my resume. It's got to be inside, which could be because I want to please my mother so much, but it's got to reflect back in yourself eventually. And the third one is you have to agree to take a couple concrete steps in the direction of this vision. You have to at least walk, you have to take some action. Hope if it's just in your head doesn't, is not effective. But many people make the mistake of saying your goal is way too big, let's lower it down to something realistic. So someone comes and says, I'd like to be the president of the United States. You say, well that's not very realistic. Let's give you something more realistic, like maybe, uh, how about volunteering for a campaign? And I said, well, that, now I don't have the motivation, that doesn't touch, I wasn't really wanting to do that. So then the guy, person treats you badly at the front door and you quit in the first day. If you say, I want to be the president, you say, okay, so what are the steps to being the president? What would, would be a couple things you do that direction? Maybe you could register to vote, you can't be president if you don't register to vote. Maybe you could volunteer for a campaign to see as a step. Now when you go there and the person treats you meanly, you don't quit because you didn't want to volunteer. You keep it because this is your path to being the president. This is along the way. There's a big difference between having a realistic objection, objective and having a step on the way to the passionate goal. So that's Bruce's three things. One is it has to be, you can see it. Two is it has to be you are turned into your passion, and three you have to take some concrete action to in that direction. My point of view is somewhat more interpersonal because I work more as a psychiatrist with people with them. So to me, the first step of hope is you have to meet somebody where they're at. If say somebody tells you a terrible story, they say, you know, my father was very mean to me. He beat me up. He told me I was no good, and then I failed in life and it fell apart and now I've got scars all over me and I've lost my jobs and I'm homeless and I can't do anything. If you come and say, well, you know, things will look up. It's not so bad. I kind of like you. You have some positive things about you. It'll work out. That is not hope. That is reassurance. That's the person says you don't really understand. The first step toward making hope happen interpersonally has to be to actually meet them. Do I understand how terrible you feel? That you have this negative thing inside you about your father and tell your, and you are actually believing he's probably right. You're probably not going to make it. And it probably isn't even worth trying anything because it's so terrible and you're sure he's right and you're, you're useless. Do I about understand it? 
I was that hopeful. That was so negative. That was so gloomy, so depressed. No, no. For hope to begin, you must meet them at the spot they're at, no matter where it is. If the spot is, you know, this pain is going on and I think I want to kill myself, you begin with, I can understand why you'd want to kill yourself this pain. I can see how it is. Step one is really meeting them where I'm at, no matter how gloomy or depressing or unhopeful that spot is. Because otherwise, you haven't made a path from where they are to the better future. You've said, well, if you can get this far, then I'll meet you there. You have to walk the rest of the way, all the way to there. The second piece, from my point of view, is agreeing to walk alongside them and share this experience. I can see how you'd be suicidal with all this pain that you're going through and you can't get out of this. And I, you want to keep meeting with me anyway? I don't know that I can do very much, but I'll agree to keep meeting with you and help you with this pain if I can. Talk and meet anyway. I'll agree to walk, I'll agree to be with you. I'll agree to share this with you. And the reason this is important, at least in my view, is that when we sit and think about some problem in our own head, and we're all by ourselves, we think it goes around and around and around, we go the same thing. Now we can do this for months or years, the same pattern, thinking over and over and over again. You put us with someone else who's with us, who's actually listening. They don't even have to say very much. They're just listening with us. And it opens the energy from just going round and round in my head to going between us. Then you start thinking different things. Because mm -hmm. the energy changed, the way the thought patterns changed, it shifted. Even if the person is saying, even if they have no idea what to say. So long as they are with you, so long as they are sharing it, so long as they're genuinely caring and interested and paying attention. Presumably that's Carl Rogers' three things of authenticity, empathy, and caring. If you offer those three things, the person will start thinking of different things. And one of the things about hope is, it's the opposite of being stuck. The main obstacle to hope is being stuck. Once you get unstuck, something will happen. So the main, you can't be hopeful as so long as you're stuck. And one of the ways to get unstuck is to share your brain and your emotions and your feelings with someone else. So, second, so first meet them where they're at or you're not really sharing. And then second is sit and listen and be there and talk a little up and back to share with, but I will walk alongside with you with this. I'll keep meeting with you all. All right, I don't see how we're going to convince your father or anything, but I'll go with you if you want, or he can come to the office and see if you want, or maybe we don't need to prove for his father. Maybe he'd be good anyway, or I don't know, but let, I'm willing to do this with you. And the third one is kind of the same as Bruce's. It says, between the two of you, you have to begin to see what's possible. I was talking to a lady we, were, we took out for... Uh, lunch because she had gotten the A's on her first set of tests at university after she'd been in hospitals for a long time. And she said she wanted to thank me. I said, well, what, what thank me? You're the one who took the actions. You did these steps. You went out and did this stuff. She said, well, you were kind of helpful too. I said, well, what did I do that was helpful? She said, well, I used to come and complain about things over and over. Her boyfriend's no good. Her apartment's no good. Her father's no good. Her man, everything's no good. She said, I would just say things like, you know, I can see you over in the college. The clothes you wear, they look kind of strange in this office, but it'll fit in over there. And you're not that much older than them, and you're kind of smart, and I can see you learning things, and I know someone who works in the disabled student's office who could help you. She said, you just kept talking about how you could see it until I could see it too. And once I could see it, then I could do it. Our job is hope visualizing. We see it through them where they're at. We meet them. We try to think, what could it be? What could I visualize better? And we try to sell it. But if we really want it to work, we have to see the world from their side. A man held up his hand like this to me one day, and he says, what do you see? I said, I see your hand. He says, no, no, be more specific. I said, okay, okay. I can see a swirls of your fingerprints. Everyone's different. I can see the creases of your knuckles. And I can see your love line and your life line. I don't know which one's which, but I can see them. He says, well, you can see nails and knuckles and hair. Then you'll be able to start helping me. Because you'll see the world from my side, 
instead of from yours. This visual vision, I need to see it because if I'm not hopeful, it's not going to work. But for the, my hope to go to them, I have to make sure it's seen from their side. Can they believe it? Maybe I can see her at school, but she, I have to make it so she can see it too. I have to help her see the things in her that makes this possible. So to me, it's about meeting someone where they're at, even if it's very depressing, and saying, I see your pain, I'm not pretending it's not there. That's reassurance. Agreeing to be there with them, being able to see what could be better. Then when I get some idea that makes me have hope, then turn around the other side, can I make this so something that they can see too? Then when they can see it, we can walk together in that direction. So for me, it's very much a relationship-based thing and hope, visual, hope visualizing comes before hope action. Or another way to put this is goal visualizing comes before goal setting or goal action. Many times we write out on our pieces of paper, this is a goal, this is what we're going to do. And then, yeah, yeah, let me sign the piece of paper. And six months later you're doing the same piece of paper because they never saw it as possible. And you didn't agree to really to work with it and it didn't start with where they are, it started with where you wanted to write down the piece of paper. That's most of what I'm trying to think about. I think of anything else about hope. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah you, you also mentioned how it could be helpful in providing it to someone. The, the main thing on that one is I have to be hopeful for someone else to be hopeful. If I don't see any way, I can still, frankly, if, even if I can't see any way, I can still be with them. And something might occur, but I better have an open mind, just as much as them, to, wait a minute, I didn't think of that. To say, hey, you know, you were talking about, you know, I just figured out what you were saying. You were talking about how your wife left you, you can't live without her, and you're just sitting by the phone waiting for her to call back, and you know she probably won't, and you're in agony, and you might as well, if you're sure she's not going to call, you might as well kill yourself. And then you said something there that struck me. You said, you better get yourself stronger, so if she calls you back, you're ready. That would work whether she calls you back or not, wouldn't it? I didn't realize at that point, we don't have to decide right now if your wife's going to call you back or not. We should work on you being stronger if she calls you back good, if she doesn't call you back good. Um, and I didn't see that before as a possibility. We have to be open to their ideas to see a possible path that we, wasn't there before. Most of hope is removing obstacles. People will say, yeah, that would be good, but I can't because of this, I can't because of this, I can't because of this, I can't because of this. Bruce would say, if they really cared about it enough passionately, they'd find ways to overcome it. Some of that is people just think around in circles and we can be a way of mirroring an open-mindedness so you can see other possibilities. Other ways that two people can, that can think of different ideas than one person can. Hmm. Yes, so maybe the, my middle question is where does it come from? How? Is it possible that you are most of your time uh, open-minded enough, to do you it. know, or hopeful enough? Well, here, I'll give you a strange answer to where it comes from. There's, I think there's three levels of doing things. The first level is we, we talk, kind of, we'll, 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 we'll make some, some plans, we'll think it about. And you can think through things. Maybe. The second way of... Actually, let me skip to the third one. The third one is we take action. We actually do something. There's one in the middle where we imagine it. Where, like, you imagine what would it be for me to be standing in front of a group of people playing the guitar. It's even thinking through or doing it. There's a time when you imagine it. And I think, where does hope come from? It usually comes from that imagination state of mind. That's when I can see it, then I can do it. It's... So I think helping the person get away from just thinking, and before they're going to take any action, can we imagine this together? Not can we think about it together, can we imagine? I think hope comes from 
imaginative ways of thinking because it's a creative act of I don't know if that's what you meant, where does it come from? But I think hope <laughs> comes from imagination. <laughs> this may be a strange answer. But <laughs> yeah, it's it. Yeah, it, it is very, for me it is where it can appear easier, better than in <coughs> thinking. Or in doing. Or, or in doing. But if you don't do anything, you're not going to achieve anything with your hope. <laughs> you have to act, take action sooner or later. Yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, sometimes people say, all right, let's think of the positive and negatives, let's see the alternatives, let's write them down. That doesn't seem to lead to hope very much. Mm-hmm. It just isn't imaginative enough or creative enough. It's it, when 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 someone says, "Wait a minute, let me put this hat on you. Look how you look in the mirror. Can you see yourself doing this?" And your imagination shifts just from that act of putting a different hat on that you normally wear, and suddenly you can see yourself on the stage, or you can see yourself taking a bus to London, or whatever it is you wanted to do. And, or, that, that, that they, they do this all the time in stores, for example, especially sporting goods stores. They sell you a pair of boots. Can you imagine yourself hiking mountains in these boots? Put them on. Now, can you imagine it? <laughs> can, you, can you imagine with, with this backpack? Yeah. Could, couldn't you go to the Himalayas with this back? Can't you look at the mirror? Can't you see the person there who could walk to the Himalayas? <laughs> Yes. That's, that's, yeah. how, that's why products sell dreams. Yeah. 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 Would you say that people are hopeful because they are able to help other people imagining things? Here's where Bruce and I de 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 depart. I don't know which one of this is right. I would say I'm hopeful because I've seen it. So I would say, you know, we, I did an exercise of people said, do you th be hopeful about this person? Do you think she could have your own apartment? She's got all these symptoms. And so people raise their hands, well, how, what makes you think so? And they say, because I've seen people like this. Yes. You're hopeful because yes. of your experience yes. you've seen. Yes. And then you're in a room of people who've seen people like that only living in hospitals, and they say, I don't think so. Why not? Because I've never seen it. Yes. <laughs> you bring for experience. Yes. And so I think our moods and our hopes go up and down depending on our experiences. Bruce takes it a different step and says, well, it depends how, what meaning you attach to those experiences. What, what, what you took in about the experience. When someone had an apartment, did you take great joy and it made you feel good about yourself during this job and then you looked for more opportunities to do this for yourself? And that's what makes it happen, is that it's got to come back to yourself. You, you turn the light back on yourself. So they did good, but now how did that matter to me? Why was that important to me? And if you can't find the personal meaning, that story isn't going to keep you going for, for, for the next one, the next one. And he might be right. <laughs> that probably goes back to the clients, too. So if you take some... I took, I took one other story like that, about internalizing. So we were taking out a lady for lunch. We like taking people out to celebrate. I think celebrations build hope too, by the way. But since celebrate lunch, and I said, I'm so proud of you. You, you. You're full of this job for the first three months. That was terrific. First job you've had in 10 years. And the other staff person said to me, why did you say that, Mark? Well, she did something good. I'm not proud of her. What's wrong with that? I said, well, what if you would have said, are you proud of yourself? What if you would have said, are you surprised that you were able to do this? Did it, you notice now you have some capability you didn't think you had before? Maybe some of those other things you thought were impossible. Now you see, maybe I could. I didn't realize I had these possibilities inside of me. Wouldn't it have been better to make the change about how she sees herself than to make it about pleasing you? So that that's a turning inwards, even for them. If you say something good happened, as well, that's because you were there with me. It's not that important. It was a good day. It was something. They make up some excuse why it doesn't count. Yeah. It has to turn inwards of 
And one of the, one of my favorite things about turning inwards is a question: Did this surprise you? Mm -hmm. Because asking that is non-judgmental. It doesn't say, is it better than you thought? Is it worse than you thought? Is it, is it just to surprise you? Because surprise is the area in which creativity emerges, in which hope emerges. If nothing surprising ever happens, there's no hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what surprising happened to you that you didn't expect? Hope comes, you were to say hope comes from, hope comes from the land of the unexpected. Otherwise, it's not really a hope, it's just a plan. You're just executing a plan. <laughs> Which is fine if, you're, if you have a good plan, <laughs> but not if you're a person who started hopeless. And I guess that's better. If you want to change from being hopeless to hopeful, that has to come from the unexpected or surprise or creativity. If you're already kind of a positive person, you just do things as planned, that's not the kind of person you're worried about in the first place. <laughs> I'm enjoying it just because you keep it at the very pragmatic level, you know, that, that's what I... And what's, what's funny for me is that I didn't expect that, because I, I wanted, you know, I wanted, from my point was more like philosophical. <laughs> you want to fancy philosophical? <laughs> hope comes from God, or hope comes from, <laughs> from positive philosophy in life, or something like this. <laughs> well, the other thing is, I don't think... The other, that may be the difference. Is I'm describing hope as a state rather than a trait that mm -hmm. says we become hopeful or hopeless and goes up and back. Presumably there's some people who are hopeful like all the time and some people are hopeless like all the time. And for that, maybe their philosophy of the relationship to God is more relevant. I'm just saying for somebody, most of us are sometimes hopeless. <laughs> Maybe we're, our belief in God isn't good enough, or our philosophy, philosophy isn't good enough, I don't know, but it, but it goes up and back. Yeah, yeah. And that's when someone who's being a psychiatrist or a guide or a peer advocate or something, can we make that happen a little bit more? I mean, I meet people sometimes, it doesn't seem no matter what you do, they're totally hopeless or they're totally hopeful. Um, so when I worked with 18 to 25 year olds, young people for us, very hard work. One of the things about them is they were always more hopeful. They just thought something good was going to happen, but they were also oblivious of the consequences. They would go out and say, no, that's not going to work like that. It's going to fall apart. You're going to go and You have to pay your rent. You need to save the money for this. You have to show them that. You need to do these things right or it's not going to work. Oh, I'm sure it'll work out. All this magical thinking. And then it wouldn't, and it would make a giant mess. And I'd say, did you learn something? No, no they didn't. They want to do it again in the same magical um, way that in some ways becoming more and more rational and cause and effect and rigid about your thinking, eliminating your what we call pejoratively or judgmentally or magical thinking, may eliminate your hopefulness to a good extent too. Because what then I can only be hopeful if it's ra reasonably hopeful. You see, would it be reasonable to be hopeful in this situation? Well. I don't know, you're terribly poor, you have a terrible mental illness, you're in chronic pain, your family left you, you have no job skills, would it be reasonably hopeful in this situation? Probably not. <laughs> Most of the people we want to be hopeful, we want them to be hopeful un unreasonably. <laughs> we need some magical thinking or some deeper thinking. Some tapping and saying, you know, all those things I just listed off, that isn't what's important about a person. That's not how you decide what hope is, whether they have a mental illness or they're poor or something or not. That's not, you're just on the surface there. The hope is going to be what's inside and deeper to dig to. You have to and what can we see inside you instead? And that's what I think the business about being with someone touches. You find that you get them in a deeper place. Um, I, so I'll give you one last thing is if you want some fancy philosophy. <laughs> is. I mentioned Carl Rogers a few moments ago. Carl Rogers. So for I didn't learn Carl Rogers in school, but people used to tell me you should pay attention. He sounds like you. He would like to So I read one of his books, and as far as I can tell, here's my two minutes. Carl Rogers is that he says nothing. Therapy isn't something you do to somebody. What you are doing is you're providing the 
within the relationship or within the fertilization of their positive things, that every every living thing has positive life force and a deteriorating death force, and that your job is to provide an environment in which the life force grows and shines and is fertilized. And he says, how do you do that? Well, three things. One is empathy. You see it from, I think you would like my back of the hand, sir. You see, you see it from their side. Not pretend I can understand. No, you have to actually. Two is authenticity. Not to have all these layers of pretending one thing or another. You actually respond out of where your real reaction is because that opens up the energy between the two people. And three is you find something to like and care about the person. What? The man is famous for that. Oh, come on, everybody does that. That's like kindergarten. What are we talking about? Think about it for a minute, though. How many people in your life do you have that really get you, who tell it to you straight, and they like you anyway? You got more than five? Yeah. Do you? No, probably not. Do you have more than two? <laughs> Most people have one or none. Yeah. And isn't he right that you treasure each of those people in your life? And isn't he right that they don't have to do anything besides those three? They don't have to give you advice or something fancy. All they have to do is be there with you, get you, tell it to you straight and like you, and the hope will come out of you. The life force will come out of you. So the philosophical part says that hope it's, 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 I don't remember someone famous said, as long as there's life, there's hope. There's life inside everybody. The stronger you make the life force, the stronger the hope is. And you can do that in a relationship. In my way of thinking of Carl Rogers, you can do it by meaning in Bruce's way of looking at things, turning it internally. You can do it by success and did that surprise you. And the other staff's way of thinking, there's a number of ways of building the life. You can do it by making creativity happen, having love happening, even by having God happen, but anything build that life because when there's life, there's hope. Yeah.